Life Audio. Of course, no one wants to go through something difficult or even difficult seasons. But one of the benefits of going through those seasons with God is this confidence that comes when we know that He's faithful and that He will help us through those seasons. And so that informs us in our future difficult moments. And that's how we start off today's psalm. As we get into the psalm, you'll see that there's this inner confidence in the psalmist's relationship with God. I pray today's episode is going to be a blessing for you. Stay tuned. This episode is brought to you by He Gets Us, a nationwide campaign all about raising the respect and relevance of Jesus. Did you see the Super Bowl ads about Jesus? Are you wondering how you can get involved? He Gets Us is a multi-year effort to raise the respect and relevance of Jesus in the United States. Thanks to this unprecedented campaign, millions of Americans are discovering the life-changing impact of Jesus. And we want you to be a part of the movement. Join more than 45,000 He Gets Us fans, getting the latest updates, inspiration, prayer ideas, and easy-to-share resources via text message by subscribing to our fans' community. To do so, text FANS to 70193. By being a fan, you can get exclusive updates on new ads, events, and other exciting news related to the He Gets Us movement. We'll also keep you inspired by giving you access to reading plans, prayer guides, and other tools to help on your spiritual journey. Join this community of like-minded individuals who share your passion for spreading the love of Jesus. Simply text FANS to 70193 to join today. Hey there, it's Nicole Yunus, host of the How to Study the Bible podcast, where every single week we join together to encounter God through His Word. You can subscribe at lifeaudio.com. Hey friends, welcome to the Hearing Jesus podcast. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? And how do you know the difference? Do you ever struggle to feel confident in your relationship with God and what He says in His Word? Do you sometimes feel stagnant or like maybe you hit a wall in your spiritual life? Hey, I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, missionary, author, pastor, and life coach, and I have been there. I too was doubting God's voice in my own life. I felt insecure about my relationship with Him, and I wanted to be obedient to what God was calling me to do, but I wasn't quite sure how to figure out what that was. I felt like I was wasting time trying to figure it out, and I just wanted a way to understand His will for my life. The answer for me was found in the pages of the scriptures, as I learned how to understand what they were actually saying. If you're ready to grow in your faith and to step confidently into the calling God has for you, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so that you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl. Today we are continuing our next set of psalms as we work through one psalm a day. And the reason why we're doing the psalms is they were the hymn book and prayer book of both Jesus and the disciples. And as we are struggling or striving to understand what Jesus's voice is in our own lives, I thought it would be really helpful for us to have a good base understanding of what it said in the Psalms. Because what we know is that it is quoted more than any other Old Testament book by Jesus and the disciples. And as we've seen, even this week, Jesus himself quotes so many of the Psalms so often that it gives us a picture of what was in his heart and his mind. As we go into the next set of Psalms, we're doing what's called the Psalms of Ascent. And it's a set of 15 Psalms that have different titles that talk about being Songs of Ascent. And of course, we ha- I say this all the time, we have to remember that while the scriptures were written for us, they were not written to us. They were written to ancient readers. And the ancient readers would have known exactly what was meant by that phrase, a song of ascent. But that understanding has kind of been lost over time. And so we can make some educated guesswork. And I just want to kind of share what a lot of scholars think that means. Some have taken it to mean a spiritual ascent. So that would be, you know, your older scholars like Augustine. That's how they understood it. There are other scholars that would believe it means a rising musical pitch like Calvin, meaning these were songs. So that seems to reference a escalation, an ascent in the music itself. And then there are other scholars that believe that it's actually literally talking about a physical ascent that involves some kind of upward movement, movement, like walking up a hill or a mountain or stairs. And so 
the contents of the Psalms themselves help us a little bit and they seem to move us towards that last suggestion that it has to do with some sort of upward movement. And that does make a lot of sense because if you think about where we're talking about within this specific region of the world, there's a lot of evidence for that. It it could have been talking about the, the steps that go up to the actual temple itself. There was 15 ascending steps. So that would have made sense. It could have talked about the view. Cause if you think about, um, you know, all the Psalms that talk about, I look up into the Hills, it's, it could be talking about the mountains that were around them. It could be talking about going up to the, the temple mounts up in Jerusalem. It, it and honestly, if it was talking about going up to the temple in Jerusalem on Zion, that's not only a physical journey, but that is also a spiritual one. And so where Jerusalem was centered, they, they especially if they're coming from surrounding nations, they would have had to have gone up. And so that's kind of how we're going to understand it. But again, it could mean a variety of things or all three potentially. I want to tell you that if you are just joining us now for the Psalms, I want to let you know that we do have some additional resources. Every Monday, I send out a newsletter that has a journaling prompt to go with each of these Psalms. And so if you go to shehears.org, you can sign up for that newsletter there. Also, if you would like the previous journaling prompts for the previous episodes, if you go to the resources page at shehears.org, you'll find the guided journals for the Psalms. And what those guided journals include is a link to the audio devotional for the day. There is the key verse for the day the journaling prompt for the day, and then actual space to journal out a little bit. And I find that journaling really helps me get that information from my head into my heart. It helps me process the information. You can either print those out and use those. You can use them on an iPad, whatever works for you. But again, it's just an additional resource to help you dig into this content a little bit more so it becomes more relevant for your own daily life. So as we dive into Psalm 120, this is the first of the Ascent Psalms. And I just wanted to point that out because a lot of us don't even really know what that means. So that's kind of why I wanted to preface the Ascent Psalms before we started this one. So I'm reading from the NIV today and I'm starting at verse 1 of Psalm 120. It says, I call on the Lord in my distress and he answers me. Save me, Lord, from lying lips and from deceitful tongues. What will he do to you and what more besides, you deceitful tongue? He will punish you with a warrior's sharp arrows, with burning coals of the broom bush. Woe to me that I dwell in Meshech, that I live among the tents of Kedar. Too long have I lived among those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. And so what we have here with this first ascent psalm. This is the first of 15 of them. The psalmist is speaking from a spot that is far away, distant from Jerusalem. And as his pilgrimage begins, he's in the middle of a foreign and dangerous people that's represented by Meshach and Kedar. And he's in a place where Salom or peace is hated. And so the psalmist is praying this lament prayer essentially and calling on God to help him in his distress. So as we go into verses one and two, the psalmist is opening with this statement of trust that God hears his prayers when he is in trouble. And that's kind of what I said at the onset of today's episode. If you've been somebody that has walked with the Lord for quite some time, you recognize a pattern of his behavior and you know that he is a God that answers prayers when we're in trouble. And I I love that, not that we want to go through those moments, but I love that we can have a confidence knowing that he's going to show up next time we're in trouble. And that kind of confidence provides this ground for the psalmist's appeal to God to save him. And his concern has to do with the people that are trying to deceive him. And he refers to them as liars and Um, He talks about different body parts representing the person, meaning the lying lips, the deceitful tongue. And he's making this reference in a really concrete way that helps us recognize that this isn't some metaphorical danger he's in, but this is a real danger that he's in with real people. And 
he's keeping in the nature of the Psalms where he's not really talking about a specific context because remember this was the hymn book of Israel. So they would apply several of these Psalms to various situations by different people at different times. And so the exact nature of whatever the deceit was, isn't mentioned. It's not like some of the other narrative texts that we have, but then he refers to peace and war in verses six and seven. And so we understand that the context could be war or put the potential for war and the liars are the enemies of the psalmist. Moving down to verses three and four, where it talks about God's punishment. The psalmist is turning from addressing God to speak about the liars as if he were communicating with those liars personally. And so he's asking a question in verse three, and then he answers it in verse four. And so mockingly, he's asking the liars and he's addressing them by the means of, you know, saying they're deceitful tongues. He's, a, he's asking them to consider the fate that God has in store for them. And then he basically tells him, them in no uncertain terms that God is going to punish them for their lies. And that punishment will come in the form of a warrior's sharp arrows and burning coals from the broom bush. And so in the context of this psalm, we see warfare. And the threat is clearly a literal threat. And so the army that is accompanying the psalmist is going to attack these deceitful people and God will see that they succeed. Okay, we're going to take a quick break and when we come back, we'll get into the rest of the psalm. Stay tuned. This episode is brought to you by He Gets Us, a nationwide campaign all about raising the respect and relevance of Jesus. Did you see the Super Bowl ads about Jesus? Are you wondering how you can get involved? He Gets Us is a multi-year effort to raise the respect and relevance of Jesus in the United States. Thanks to this unprecedented campaign, millions of Americans are discovering the life-changing impact of Jesus. And we want you to be a part of the movement. Join more than 45,000 He Gets Us fans getting the latest updates, inspiration, prayer ideas, and easy-to-share resources via text message by subscribing to our fans' community. To do so, text FANS to 70193. By being a fan, you can get exclusive updates on new ads, events, and other exciting news related to the He Gets Us movement. We'll also keep you inspired by giving you access to reading plans, prayer guides, and other tools to help on your spiritual journey. Join this community of like-minded individuals who share your passion for spreading the love of Jesus. Simply text FANS to 70193 to join today. Our world can feel chaotic and uncertain, but we don't have to live enslaved to fear. Christ has promised you and I his peace, and throughout scripture, he has provided powerful truths and practical steps to help us experience greater freedom. I'm Jennifer Slattery, lead host of the Faith Over Fear podcast, inviting you to join me and my team as together we learn how to starve our fears and grow our faith. Subscribe at lifeaudio.com. And then the second punishment, burning coals of the broom bush, it's not an obvious military punishment, although there are some negative implications that we can recognize the, the burning coals. I mean, that it's destructive, um, but the broom bu brush, or it's a shrub, essentially, it grows in Palestine. Arabia and Egypt in that region of the world. And it can reach a height that can provide shade like it did for, if you remember Elijah in the wilderness in first Kings, the roots can be extracted and burned like charcoal. And so some versions speak about that in the sense of Job's description of the poor who worn, who warm themselves by the root of the broom. That's what they're talking about. That, that root of the broom bush is used in that region of the world as a sort of charcoal. And so the NIV would read it as their food was the root of the broom bush. But that reference to the broom bush may indicate this wilderness setting for the psalmist. Again, this is an indication that he's far away from Jerusalem right now. Moving down to verses five and six where he's talking about being among hostile strangers. This is a lament song and it ends on a sad note where he is complaining about his condition. And I just want to mention that because I think one of the things that the, the, the lament Psalms does is it teaches us that it's okay to complain. 
And I know that may sound counterintuitive, and we talked about this before on the podcast. There's a difference between complaining to God or complaining about God. What the psalmist is doing here is complaining to God. And I think there's an extraordinary measure of faith when we feel confident enough in our relationship with him that we can complain to him. You know, there are instances where I'm going through a situation and I will complain about that situation to my husband. I'm not complaining about my husband, but I'm complaining to my husband. And what do I receive from my husband? Usually it's some sort of comfort, whether it's a hug or a word of encouragement or a strategy or an insight that I may not have recognized before. The reason why I go to him and I complain to him is because the comfort that I receive in him. And I think sometimes we forget that God longs to be involved in those aspects of our lives, even the hard aspects. And so I love the lament Psalms teach us that it's okay to complain to God. And so that's what we're seeing here. Um, this, the section that we're in right now, it begins with this exclamation of sadness, woe. And then we have to remember because these were Psalms that were used, hymns that were used in other settings, this one would be one that would be heard in funeral processions. We see that in first Kings, we see that in Jeremiah, we see that in Amos and there are some of these Psalms that have been come to known as woe oracles, meaning they're prophetic oracles that are pronouncing woes on the nations and they're pronouncing them as good as dead. We see that in Isaiah and Amos and Micah and Nahum and a couple, a couple other places in the Old Testament. So here what the prophet is saying is that he might as well be dead since he finds him in this place, Meshech, far away among the tents of Kedar, far away from Jerusalem. Now, Meshech is known as a nomadic tribe that has descended from Japheth. We read about that in Genesis chapter 10 and 1 Chronicles chapter 1. And so it's associated with Asia Minor. Other places, Meshech is described as having a trade relation with Tyre. That's mentioned in Ezekiel. And, and it's also part of Magog, which is part of Babylon. So Kedar is a nomadic tribe that is descended from Abraham through Ishmael. If you remember that story, Genesis 25, 1 Chronicles 1, they, they were a herder or shepherd kind of people group. And what the psalm indicates, in addition to what we know from this people group, is they lived in tents. Jeremiah places them in this eastern portion of the Arabian desert, and it's not clear if Meshech and Kedar are in the same place. And it, it maybe the intention there is not to be so specific. So the people that are using that in other circumstances can recognize the meaning without necessarily the specifics. But the two nomadic desert tribes that are mentioned are an indication, again, that the psalmist is far away from home and in a desolate place. And you might not understand that if you're just reading through that and you don't recognize those names or don't remember where else they are in scripture. But it's kind of the modern day equivalent of saying like, I am as good as dead. I'm all the way out here in Timbuktu. Now, of course, Timbuktu is a literal real place, but that expression is known in our culture as being in the middle of nowhere. And it's this idea of being really far away from the comforts of home. And so wherever the psalmist is, wherever he's at, the place is dangerous. He wants peace, but they want war. And so the only option he has right now is to call on God to help him. And, you know, not, not in any way, shape or form was my situation as bad as his. But as I was reading this, I remembered thinking about this one time, and I think I have talked about this on the podcast like a year and a half or two years ago, but my husband and I, we um, were out for a drive in T Timbuktu. We were in the middle of nowhere. We were pretty far away from home, and it was in the middle of a national forest. He had spent some time there, so he felt pretty confident, um, you know, being driving around in those roads there. But if you have spent any time in some of the national forests up in the northeastern part of the country. You may know, or maybe I, I didn't know this, but you may know or you may recognize that a lot of those roads look the same, especially when you go back in the forest. And we were 
a course up in the mountains and the GPS doesn't always work up there. So we had this confidence of thinking like we knew exactly where we were going. And it wasn't until we were up there and had made a couple turns where we realized our GPS was no longer working. And of course we didn't have food. We didn't have water. We didn't even really have that much gas. We were in the middle of nowhere. We weren't like camping or anything. We were just out for, we were driving around and we were, we were in a situation. Uh, I mean, truly, we really were where we were pretty fearful. We did not have our kids. This was a long time ago, but I remember just thinking like, we're in the middle of Timbuktu. I don't know if we could, we could even, if we could even survive the night, um, you know, the weather wasn't that great. What, like, what are we, what are we doing? And thankfully we didn't have physical enemies that were trying to attack us, but there were, you know, bears and predators in that in that part of the country and so there was this overwhelming sense of fear but I think what took over in me was the same kind of confidence that we see in the psalmist where I was like okay God I know that you're faithful I know that you've proven yourself faithful time and time again so I'm in a desperate situation I'm coming to you and asking you for help because I don't know how I'm gonna get out of here I don't know I we don't know what we're doing we don't we don't even know how we really got here Um, there is this potential for danger. We're literally in the middle of nowhere. God, we need your help. And there was a peace that was there, even though there wasn't an immediate answer, there was a peace that was there. And what eventually happened was there was somebody else that drove by and we ended up just following them. And eventually they let us out of, of that part of the forest. Thank God he sent them. But I remember just thinking like, I didn't even really have that much animosity or an anxiety when it was happening. Instead, I had peace because I knew that we serve a God that meets us in our distress. And while that cannot be compared to what the psalmist was going through, where it was war and enemies were closing in on him, I think the emotion behind that can be something that we can reconcile and we can relate to because I think we've all had some of those moments in our lives where We're in a place of desperation. The confidence that comes from knowing that God is a God that shows up is what helps us through those moments. And so as modern readers of this psalm, we can use this psalm as a model prayer for when we're facing things like hostility or deceit or the feeling of desperation, or when we are in a strange land, or far away from home, any of those kinds of things. And the psalmist is longing to be home. He doesn't want to be far away, because for him, home means safety. And for the ancient psalmist, for this ancient people group that would have been the original hearers of this psalm, home would be near the place where God made his presence known, probably at Mount Zion, in Jerusalem. So his prayer indicates this belief that God can answer him and make his presence known, even in some place as far away as Meshech or Kedar. And the New Testament proclaims that Christ is the very presence of God. And because of that, he sends his spirit to dwell in us. So even in the middle of Timbuktu, we can be in God's presence. And I'm so thankful for that. So I'm going to go ahead, given that insight, and reread this psalm, starting at verse 1. I call on the Lord in my distress, and he answers me. Save me, Lord, from lying lips and from deceitful tongues. What will he do to you, and what more besides you deceitful tongue? He will punish you with the warrior's sharp arrows, with burning coals of the broom bush. Woe to me that I dwell in Meshech, that I live among the tents of Kedar, Too long have I lived among those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. God, we thank you that you are the Lord that answers us when we call on you in our distress. Lord, we ask that you would save us in those moments. You would save us from the lying lips. You would save us from the deceitful tongues. You would save us when we are far away from home and facing some sort of danger. And God, I thank you for the confidence that we can have in our relationship with you and knowing who you are when we get to the other side of those moments. Lord, I pray for my friend that might be going through one of those moments right now. I pray that you, by your spirit, would overwhelm them with direction and with peace and with instruction, God. 
make yourself known to them in a way that's tangible and real. And Lord, we thank you that because of Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, your presence can be with us even when we're in the middle of nowhere. Lord, I thank you for that and the reality that your spirit is in our lives. I thank you and I praise you in all things. Amen. Hey friend, do you feel like you need a little bit of one-on-one? I don't know about you, but sometimes when I go through the scriptures or I go through the biblical concepts, I find myself thinking, okay, but how do I actually apply that in my life? Or if you've come to this podcast, it's likely because you desire to hear Jesus more clearly, to be confident in what he's saying in your life, the way he's leading you. I want you to know that I offer life coaching and spiritual direction. And while the two are similar, they're also kind of different. Life coaching is when we set goals and and I help hold you accountable and help break those down into bite-sized manageable pieces to help you achieve those goals. But spiritual direction takes it one step further. We invite Jesus into the process. And through spiritual direction, the goal of that really is to help you hear God's voice more clearly. And so there's things that we will do like prayer projects and spiritual gifts testing and a life map and all sorts of things to help you get to a place where you can see this thread of redemption that God has woven throughout your life. And then also to set you up so that you can hear God's voice for yourself. Because ultimately, the reason why I do the the podcast and I write the books and I have all the resources available is because I want you to settle into this place where you are confident in knowing the difference between God's voice, your own voice and the enemy's voice. So if that sounds like something that you would like to do, um, life coaching right now runs about $97 for an hour. And that's for one person. I also have group rates available. And if you want to schedule that, it's if you go to shehears.org, you can go, there's a Calendly link where it says work with me and you can set up a time that works for you. I would count it an honor and a privilege to be able to walk alongside of you in that process. I want to take just a second to thank the team at Life Audio for their partnership with us on the podcast. If you go to lifeaudio.com, you'll find dozens of other faith-centered podcasts in their network. They've got shows about prayer, Bible study, parenting, and more. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you for God's call on your life, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you this week. Know that you are loved, you are cherished, and you are His. What happens when a writer and former history teacher goes toe-to-toe with his best friend, a nationally touring stand-up comedian? Total carnage, that's what. Two men enter, and two men leave, because that's how it works. (laughs) Actually, you get hilarious, real, and insightful conversations about life, history, culture, faith, and everything in between. Join me, comedian Johnny W., and my pal, author and speaker John Driver, for Talk About That at LifeAudio.com or wherever you get your podcasts.